when you start with the best ingredients and you have the best people to put them together, then you really have something. Yeah, we're gonna cook. Chef Carolina and Chef Fideli joined us from Italy and they run the kitchens here at Cinderella. John, you pass me the sugar. Buongiorno, hey, buongiorno, Joe, come stiamo? What are you up to? Uh, we're preparing for the big weekend, it's coming up. The teams make everything from scratch. The freshest ingredients make the most delicious food. Let's make lasagna. Our lasagna is the best in New York. Andiamo, guys. It's 16 lean lasagna, freshly ground sirloin with the bolognese sauce. For cheeses, fondina, parmigiano, romano, and fresh mozzarella. We get all the best ingredients from all over the world to create our menu at the Cinderella Kitchen. Gooey melted cheese, give us the final touch. Let's see how this batch of lasagna came out. That's pretty good. We make everything here, from pork chops to chicken soup to roasted vegetables to stuffed artichokes to roasted turkey breast. It's all from scratch. And don't forget the desserts also. Handmade from beginning to end. Tutto è fresco, everything fresh, every detail matters. And tell me the, the truth. Wow, you must have made a mistake. It's delicious. No, Joe, it's really good. <laughs> we have the best team here at the Cinderella Kitchen. It's like family. At Cinderella, we make delicious fresh food, fresh from the source, for the most discerning city in the world, every day. Hi everyone, welcome to Stirring the Pot. I'm Andrea Grover, I'm the Executive Director of Guild Hall. And I wanna first thank our sponsor, Citarella, uh, who's been with us for almost since the inception of this series, which is celebrating 10 years this summer. Um, and also to our media sponsor, Edible East End. Um, Stirring the Pot was started 10 years ago by our trustee, Florence Fabrican, who is an author and New York Times food and wine writer. It's really one of my favorite series because not only is Florence an expert interviewer, but this is her life work to really understand culinary arts and cuisine and the way that people interact with food and wine, et cetera. Um, so we're thrilled to have her as part of our board and the initiator of this series, which has hosted chefs and authors from across the US. Um, we also are thrilled to have Dan Barber with us uh, kicking off the season. He's chef and co-owner of Blue Hill and Blue Hill at Stone Farms. His book will be for sale in East Hampton at Book Hampton through our partnership with them. It's titled The Third Plate and uh, Field Notes on the Future of Food. So pick that up at Book Hampton, East Hampton. There are three more Stirring the Pots this summer. We have uh, Mark Bittman coming on August 1st, or I should say on Zoom August 1st. We have Pierre Chiam on August 8th, 8th, and we have Dory Greenspan on August 15th. So mark your calendar for those conversations with Florence. Uh, there's a Q&A after the talk, so feel free to post your questions in the chat window. And Joe Brando, our Director of Digital Content, will rejoin after the conversation and work through those questions with Florence and Dan. We also have a special 10% discount today for you only at Dan Barber's website, which is bluehillmarket.com. We'll be putting that discount, discount code in the chat window. So I wanna welcome you all and thank you for joining the 10th season of Stirring the Pot. Please welcome Florence Fabrican and Dan Barber. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a kind of gloomy morning here in East Hampton. So it's a good time to sit and have a conversation. If you're having coffee, have your coffee or whatever. And uh, I am so delighted to be able to continue this series now that uh, we started, it doesn't seem like 10 years somehow, but if I go through the list of who the guests have been, I guess it adds up. Um, but it is so interesting for me to be able to talk to chefs and food personalities and really find out 
what makes them tick. And I hope you appreciate and will enjoy what, uh, what they have to say and have enjoyed in the past. And we'll have some questions for us. And I am also so delighted that Dan Barber, who, was, who tried everything to be able to join us last summer and couldn't. And so he's here now to kick off the series. And he is quite an interesting and complex food personality. So let's get started. Uh, good morning, Dan. Good morning, Florence. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Um, Dan, you um, are not just a chef. You uh, have very strong views on sustainability, the environment, and through a very, very unique establishment that you run. I don't know if everybody in the audience knows what Stone Barns represents. I mean, lots of chefs have little farms or big farms, but very few, maybe none, have an establishment like Stone Barns. So why don't we start with you telling us about Stone Barns, what it represents, what it is, and how you got involved. Well, thank you for the introduction. I, I, I will say that I'm, I have strong views in part or, or mostly coming from how I cook food. You know, I don't know if you ever knew this, but my, my food is so simple. You know, and I was always uh, in, um, uh, insecure about it. I mean, I still am insecure. I've got a I've got a truckload of insecurities, Florence. But one of them is just that I I never uh, drank the Kool Aid of like tons of ingredients and multiple cooking methods that met on a dish. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because in the hands of the great chefs, it soars, as you know. Um, but I I don't. And that wasn't as my cooks say, my jam, you know? And I, my thing was always just like very sort of unplugged and, and simplistic. I mean, the, 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 the discipline that's behind the dishes is, is complex. I'm not being falsely modest, but, but they were always very sort of like, you know, unplugged. And that drove me to understand and concentrate on the ingredients. And then it, it's like peeling an onion. It was like, what's the ingredient? And then it was like, where it's coming from. And then what kind of farmer and um, how are they rotating the crops? And then at what point do you want uh, them harvesting it in the season? And then to the seed. Uh, and it just, that's been the, the, the arc of where my, you know, where my cooking has gone, but it started with this, this need to have the ingredients sing because I wasn't hiding anything, I hide nothing. So if they weren't really delicious, truly like jaw dropping, like delicious. I was out of business. So that's what, that's what started this whole thing. I didn't come at it from an environmental. I mean, I'm no more of an environmentalist than you are. Uh, and most of the people on this, on this program, um, you know, I, so, so I got interested and I, I grew up in where I'm at Blue Hill farm, which is where I am right now. I'm in a bunker. I built this during COVID so I could have some, some sanctuary for my kids who are, who are, um, five and now five and eight. Um, and, uh, anyway, this is a dairy farm. And I, I spent most, I spent all my summers taking care of the farm. Um, but the Rockefeller family approached uh, my brother and I soon after we opened Blue Hill, New York, uh, which was an ode to this farm, really. Uh, we, we got a ton of ingredients from this farm and from other farms in the Hudson Valley. And Mr. Rockefeller wanted his own farm and restaurant. And that's how we started Stone Barns that became an educational center uh, for sustainable agriculture uh, and food. And so, so not only am I uh, pursuing uh, the, what I need to pursue for my uh, dishes, as I said, my simplistic dishes, but I also have a bully pulpit now to talk about these issues because we are not just a farm to table restaurant. Actually, we are a table in the middle of a farm. So I've I got a skin in the game. And that's what, that's what we're pursuing at, at Stone Barns. And as we know, over the last 20 years, these issues have become more mainstream and as we circle out of COVID and see the health effects of our country and the, the broken food system that we have inherited now or created, uh, there's a lot of work to do. Well, uh, yes, I had forgotten about the fact that Blue Hill predated Stone Barns in terms of your involvement by a long shot. Um, but I would like you to describe the Stone Barns installation, physically what it looks like, where it is and what it how it evolved. 
Yeah, well, John D. Rock, the oil baron, uh, went to Albany, the story goes, one day and put a map down in front of the governor and put a circle, um, which he said would be on this hilltop called Pacatico Hills, and that would be his, his uh, to own. And he bought the whole thing. It was 4,000 acres. This was back in the 1910s, 1920s. Uh, and uh, from 1920s onward, uh, many mansions were built of Rockefeller many estates that eventually went to the uh, uh, to the brothers of uh, the, the grandsons. Sorry, of, of uh, Mr. Rockefeller had one son, and he had uh, five children. And those those five children all had estates. And and surround in the midst of the estates was a um, old stone barns that was built in the late 20s uh, that became the farm. Uh, for the grandkids, and they would milk uh, on Sundays before they went to church, and uh, and when they grew up, the farm pretty much remained open space for sure, but remained dormant. I mean, there was some cattle raising from David Rockefeller's wife, uh, and when he got to be in his 80s, he wanted it to survive, and so he created this non-for-profit Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture so that it would live beyond him, and he died just a few years ago, and it is now in a trust, uh, and uh, it is a non-for-profit educational entity that grows food, and, and we cook food, <laughs> so that's the, that's the trajectory, and it, and it was a very, it was a, it had a lot of foresight because these these 80 100 acres and now we've expanded basically to 250 acres uh is protected from development which was a great gift to the rockefeller family yeah especially in a heavily uh populated region like 20, 20 miles from new york city you know this yeah. doesn't happen it's, anymore <laughs> it's just amazing um and yet when you talk about your involvement and your interest starting with ingredients you were kind of in those days, you were at the cusp of, I would say, of movement where fine dining was transitioning from this attitude of um, uh, having fresh raspberries year round was a fine restaurant or asparagus. And it said that uh, at one point people began to realize and the whole field began to realize that a great restaurant is not one is is not one that serves raspberries in December, but it's one that doesn't. That's and, what I grew up with. The big fat raspberries in the middle of January was the, the yeah, sign that you yeah. were at the creme de la creme. <laughs> or the year-round strawberry. And okay, yeah. maybe you can ship them from California or Chile. Yeah. It's not the same as what I mean, I think of the strawberries that are basically gone from this region seasonally now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how wonderful they are. But this whole idea that knowing where the ingredients are and respecting them has changed food in so many ways. Wouldn't you agree? I would. I think I, I don't want to take any credit for it. I was really the beneficiary of some visionary chefs. I would say it started with Nouvelle Cuisine. I mean, we, we these were a group of French chefs, Paul Bocuse and Alain Chappelle and the Trois Gros brothers and Michel Garrard, all the chefs you have met and, 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 and I'm sure know uh, throughout your career, but these were visionaries in the 70s who said, I don't want to be dictated to about the strawberry on my menu. I don't want to be evaluated for classic dishes and how I interpret them because they're out of season and they have nothing to do with locality anymore. And you, Michelin is judging us on dishes that were evolved far away from where we are and have nothing to do with our, with our particular micro culture and and who I am and they be, they were renegades they were the the refugia and and we think about uh, nouvelle cuisine as small tiny plates of, but that was bad nouvelle cuisine real nouvelle cuisine was a rejection of the status quo and it was the chef who came out from the basement who had been there you know getting drunk and 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 being totally ostracized to one who put a signature on the menu really and created their own art uh, and expressed it through dishes and through their their culture and their their uh, uh, background and 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 it was it was engine the engine for it was the morning market uh, and that though the disciples of those those the, the disciples, uh, you know, the 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 um, younger generation that worked with these visionaries, many of them came to America. Jean Louis Paladin, uh, David Boulet, Daniel Ballou, Jean Georges Vangerich, and all the chefs that we 
think about in the last 20 years as um, uh, evolving cuisine to what it is today, they were the beneficiaries of those visionaries. I am the, I am the third generation. I'm the next generation. I've only benefited from what these others have, have blazed a path because what I'm doing would not have been acceptable in the, in, in this, in, in the eighties, uh, you know, it's hard to change then. And you had a hand in changing it. You were reporting it. So uh, you should, you should weigh in on this and tell me if I, if I said that correctly. No, I think you did. Uh, because before Nouvelle Cuisine, before Paul Bocuse, you think about most of the great restaurants in France, because that's basically where the focus was. But even in the US, you never had a chef's name attached to the restaurant. It was the tie of all. Nobody knew who uh, Claude Deligne was, and he didn't want anybody to know. He didn't care, but he was the chef there for generations, for decades, or... Uh, La Perouse, another three-star Michelin. Who was the chef there? Who knows? Uh, uh, Le Grand Vefour. You think of those names and the names of the chefs were never attached to the restaurant names. And even in New York, uh, Le Pavillon, Brussels, names like that. Who were the chefs? Well, you knew Henri Soule and he had a connection to East Hampton, as a matter of fact. But, but by and large, it was the chef, it was the restaurant name and the restaurateur who drove the concept and the chef was a hired hand. Right. But that right. has totally changed. I flipped on its head. I really do think it started with Nouvelle Cuisine chefs, but it's but it's continued and chefs are chefs, of course, they're the, they're the leading lights. If I were to make a prediction, Florence, uh, we have the chance to talk, let's say in 10 years, uh, we reflect on this time. I would say that the next wave is going to be the the farmer um, and the local ecology, the local environment is going to dictate the menu. Um, I don't know that they will be the stars in the same way that chefs are the the you know the leading lights today, but they will dictate more and more because what we're seeing uh, out coming out of this transformation that we're talking about is people, diners going to different cities, different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and expecting something unique. Now, you know that 30 years ago, it was the exact opposite. You went to different parts of the country and had a very similar dishes and you were, you were, you were evaluated on how you prepare those dishes. Today, that's, that's anachronistic. I mean, that's just like middle-aged stuff. You know? Today, it's I'm going to a restaurant to get something I can't get anywhere else in the world. And that is driven by the history, the culture, and the ecology of the place. That's a very exciting transformation. And I think it's just beginning. And that means that French food or the French discipline, I don't, it's not going to disappear, but it will not predominate there will be a whole host of other voices uh, in this you know, cultural context and cuisine uh, affirmation. That's, I think, very exciting. Well, look at the degree to which street food has uh, yeah. seeped in to fine yeah. dining. Yeah. Are you doing any street food items <laughs> in your restaurant? I'm, yeah, I mean, all of my dishes are in one way or another you know, from a kind of, uh, uh, you know, home cooking, peasant food, um, uh, uh, historical culture context that I am reinventing. Uh, so, so in that street food. So yes, my, it's a nod to all of that. We just, we repackage it, <laughs> uh, which, you know, uh, sometimes I, I need to admit more than I do. Yeah. I mean, the taco is everywhere, right? Yeah. 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 No, I have yet, I'm not yet serving a burger, but we, we did a project called Wasted uh, that was about, sort. we did a, a pop-up restaurant where we only served food, wasted food, food that was in the trash. And we made a burger. Uh, so this was an ode to street food, but instead of making a beef burger, we made a burger of all the waste that is created from the juice craze. Because I, I used to walk to work every morning a few years ago and do Jamba juice or whatever. And I would watch the machines in the morning, just the lines and the machine goes, zzz, zzz. and I always wondered, what do you do with the pulp? After all that stuff is juice, and I would see the pulp being dumped into the trash. So I went to the uh, got I went to the, the owner of Jamba Juice on Sixth Avenue. I said, "Can I grab the pulp?" And we did some experiments, and we made it into a burger with a bunch of other ingredients, but no meat. It was a vegetable burger uh, made with vegetable um, uh, scraps from the juicing process, uh, and it was great. It was a great, great project and a great burger. But but that was a, a nod to the to, to street food, just reinvented for today's wasteful. American food culture, as it were. Well, basically, you're talking about what Massimo Bottura is doing. Uh, he just started this initiative called Why Waste? And he's got uh, his chefs at his various restaurants contributing recipes for like um, vegetable peeling, uh, 
uh, fond de glace stocks and turning them into, he's got a, the website now, uh, or it's on Instagram and you can find these recipes. It's hashtag why waste, I believe. And uh, he is even inviting people who participate to send in their ideas and their recipes. But he's passionate about this and his repertorio system of um, massive uh, dining halls to feed the needy and the homeless does take advantage of uh, what there is in terms of say leftovers. I will tell you that during this pandemic, I have made more leftover soup than you can name. And they call them lost recipes because I haven't written them down and I'll never reproduce them exactly. I have learned over the years to write down stuff I cook off the top of my head simply because if it's good, I'll want the recipe. But for these soups, they go in the Vitamix, <laughs> whatever we've got, add water. Yeah. Uh, so you were doing a lot of cooking during the show, like everybody else. I'm, I'm sure you're always cooking, Florence. I've never been invited over, but I, I imagine that you are doing some very good cooking in your home kitchen. Yeah, I do good cooking. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. you want an invitation? I'll Listen, I, you know, that's a hint. It's more than a hint. <laughs> No, but a lot of my cooking is really ad hoc and, or I cook with my kids and um, and then I go out to eat a lot because I have to do that. Yeah, you have to stay current. Do you yeah. feel like you're getting better in in appreciating? I mean, do you feel like your your tastes and your your radar for what's good is better than it used to be? Or where, where do you where do you have you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've always I, you know, without sounding arrogant, I've always had a very good palate. Um. I don't know where it came from. My mother was a very good cook. I don't know who's interviewing who right now, but I will tell you, I have memories of being maybe four years old and the family would go out for Chinese food on Sunday nights. And I would spend an inordinate amount of time trying to get exactly the right amount of soy sauce into my egg drop soup. It had to be a very certain color and flavor. Nice. And it was something I did. And I can remember that going way back. I have food memories that I can conjure up from decades ago. So yeah. Uh, I remember like, the first time I cooked for you. Do you remember the first time I cooked for you? Was that at Bernard's house? It was, yes. It was or one of his hotels. No, it was in Bernard's house in, uh, well, I mean, not to be too specific, but it was February 16th of 1995. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I remember it so well because it was a, it was a, it was a round table of lumen of of luminary food luminaries. Uh, you being the one that I was just was I didn't sleep for four nights, uh, and I did a tasting menu and um, I the food was meh, mediocre. But I'll never forget what you said when I came out the of the kitchen because I looked right at you. You know I couldn't believe I was cooking for you, uh, and and you looked up at me and said, the salmon was perfectly cooked. <laughs> and what I rec I've, I've taught a lot about that over the years. And what now I've come to realize in my wisdom because I took it at first to be like, she loved the meal, you know, and I told everyone, Florence, who just what, thought the meal was awesome. But actually, instead of saying, you know, the meal was mediocre and you really have a long way to go, you pointed to the one thing and actually it was cooked perfectly uh, and, and zeroed on. It's very smart. So you gave the impression of like, what a wonderful experience I have. But really, if you were to pinpoint it like a good journalist, you were just saying one thing was good and <laughs> the rest of it, nah. Anyway. Well, um, I don't remember that. I remember it <laughs> like it was this morning. But, you know, the whole subject of salmon is I'm so conflicted because for the most part, I mean, I just last year we published the Ladies Village Improvement Society cookbook. And I have to say it is a salmon free cookbook because it is a local East Hampton cookbook. And I feel that there is really no need to have salmon every single day in and on every single menu. Uh, that said, right now it's uh, Copper River season and I will buy Alaskan salmon when it is in season, but the year-round salmon thing. That's done. I, took, I wouldn't I'm do over it. Over that. Yeah. No, I would support. Um, we do. We support fisheries in Alaska. Alaskan kings and 
um, and yes, the Copper River, because they're, they're so regulated. You know, you think of Alaska as like the Republican strong, that nothing is regulated and whatever, but for fisheries, there's no place like Alaska in the world. Um, yeah. and, and so you're buying salmon, you're buying salmon that are supporting the fisheries that you want to support. So I, I applaud a lot that. of the A lot of the fishermen are indigenous and control mm -hmm. the fishing grounds. For generations, terribly... they have the licenses. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure. Yeah, but that's why it's so tightly regulated. You can only take a certain amount of fish and they stop and then they close down the season. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's the, it's really like one of the great- They freeze great it programs. immediately. They freeze it immediately and ship it. They're very good at maintaining yeah. quality. The yeah. other salmon-like fish that I will buy because it is more or less local is the steelhead they're now doing up in Hudson. What do you, you told think me about that? that? I mean, I, did, I I tasted it once a while ago. It's good, good. I, I you know, okay. I, I I'm not not going nuts over it. But if you want something that's like salmon, it's a great option. Yeah, I agree. And then you can get it out here. What yeah, are yeah. Your, what are your favorite fish? You know what I'm really interested in. Uh, yeah, obviously, I'm really devoted to local fish. So um, uh, you know, I I love trigger fish. I love. I love bass right now, which is running like crazy and in pretty good stocks. Black um, striped. Uh, uh, well, I mean, black bass is my favorite fish, but I it's often not in great shape. So I I tend to right now uh, 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 nod towards striped bass. Uh, but, but I mean, all that local fish I just find to be so extraordinary. So I'm I'm sort of Catholic about my my options. There's not many fish in the sea I don't like. I don't love farm-raised fish in general. Um, oh, I'd rather I just get fish, yeah. yeah. What about bronzino? I do love bronzino. Uh, great fish to cook. Uh, you know, you look like a pro. It's very hard to overcook bronzino. So it's a good one. Good one, for sure. Yeah, see, I don't care for it. And I, you know, they ship it from Europe and who needs it? is my feeling. Yeah, I don't have it on my menu. I thought you were just saying as a comment about the fish. No, I haven't had that in years um, and I've never put it on my menu. We really put some local fish on the menu and we're really pretty fanatical about it coming out of the water and treating it from there. So, um, and we don't have fish all over our menu. So I, I'm not, I don't have a menu, you know? I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not forced into having a three fish as entrees thing. I don't have to do that, which is so freeing. Talk about taking things into control. It's like someone sits down in the restaurant, they don't know what menu they're getting and every table gets a different menu. So when we have, you know, a, a boat of, of bass, we'll often serve it with, um, you know, with a boat of butterfish too, because those are, those are often butter uh, bycatch. So we give you a course of the butterfish first, and then you, then you get to have your striped bass because they both come together in the net. And so that's how we create the menu is, you know, it's very, very balanced um, and, and it's how I like to cook. So, but yeah, if you come into my restaurant for a big honker of wild striped bass, uh, you know, six or seven ounce piece of protein of bass or salmon or whatever, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the place for you. What do you do with the butterfish? Butterfish is one of my favorite fish. I mean, we, we, so we do, so we tell a story about how they catch the fish. So it's butterfish and, and monkfish, sometimes butterfish and, and, and basses. It's, so it, it depends, but Often we'll serve, uh, you know, butterfish. Often we'll serve uh, butterfish with phytoplankton, which is the food that the butterfish eat, and then uh, the bigger fish are eating the butterfish. So it's this you, you start to learn about the, the food chain and under the ocean. Uh, so we'll do something with phytoplankton always because that's the baseline. That's the that's the that's the health of the ocean is phytoplankton. Then we go to lower trophic fish like butterfish, which is often the bycatch of your next course. And we'll do a, a little uh, uh, a roasted, quick roasted butterfish, and then serve on the side as a cracker the bones. So we we mar we we break down the, the 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 bones by a marination and then fry it. So then you have a chip with the butterfish or the bones, and then you get to eat your bass, and only then you get to eat your bass. <laughs> Yeah, well, the Chinese, gotta work for it. The Chinese do a great job with fish bones. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. Like I said, I'm just taking what others have figured out a long time ago and repackaging it. Yeah, and also even fish skin. You're yeah. starting to see fish skin chips and. Yeah yeah yeah. Delicious, delicious. Yeah. So what are you harvesting on the farm now? Uh, well, see, right now I'm at Blue Hill Farm because I'm I'm doing an experiment with chickens. I have this obsession with creating uh, a, a a chicken egg that's 100% uh, 
uh, from wasted food. Now, it's not just wasted food as in scraps that you don't put into your soup and you, you know, put into compost because that food stream goes to pigs. So for the last uh, eight years, we per we've perfected a system of feeding pigs 100% waste feed, 100% waste. So every all the trimmings from our from our kitchen, we have uh, post um, uh, a grain from from beer making. Uh, the mash feeds them. We go to supermarkets in the area, and we get all the expired dairy. We put this all together at a huge mash, and that's what feeds the pigs. And it's the most delicious pig you've ever eaten in your life. We don't raise. We only raise. We used to raise on the grain feed. We used to raise 150 pigs a year. Now we raise about 80 pigs a year, but we stretch the pig. So now you're no, no longer getting, you know, a pork chop in my restaurant. You're going to get little pieces of, of pork, cured pork, pork skin, pork fat, uh, pork offal throughout, you know, infused throughout your meal. Uh, and that's how we share the pig. And we stretch the pig as much, and we use as much pig, but we, we feed a lot more people than we used to. Um, and that's all waste fat. So then I thought there's one thing that just bugs, bugs, bugs me. Is these is the is the eggs is uh, you know we shouldn't be transporting grain to feed chickens from the Midwest feed the chickens and 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 raise the chickens and call that egg sustainable because it, the chicken was raised next to me no not good enough so I've started on this project uh, to do post consumer waste that means scrapings from the dining room uh, and before you turn your nose up at that the law says that uh, you cannot feed post consumer waste to any animal that you eat directly. But, but if you want to feed a chicken that lays an egg, uh, post-consumer scrapings from a plate that's been touched by, by, by a human, you are allowed to. Because the egg is one generation removed and therefore it's kosher. So that's what we're trying to do right now is we're taking scrapings from both our restaurants uh, from our catering operation, uh, from anywhere we can. And we're making this big mash and we're slowly introducing the chicken. So I've got my testers here. Uh, I've got uh, five testing chickens that we are beginning the waste feeding diet. And then we're going to expand it as we move forward. If I kill them, we obviously won't expand it. But if, I, if I'm successful, uh, you'll see this up at Stone, you'll see this at Stone Barns uh, this fall. The chickens themselves, you cannot serve. The chickens themselves, we cannot serve legally. No, no. And th those are broiler chickens. Those are roaster chickens. They take a tremendous amount of feed. I don't want to get into that. No, I'm getting into these egg layers. Uh, what I need to do is figure out the recipe, like what, what needs to be in their diet. And as this guy in, in Ohio, I feel there's so many scientists working on chicken health uh, for eggs. It's amazing. It's a whole world. And as he said to me, I just talked to him on Friday. He said to me, we know more about what a chicken needs for optimum health than we know about human health. <laughs> and he was, he was boasting. And I was thinking, that's not right. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to use your research. But I was, I got a phone. I was like, wait a minute, that's not something to boast about. Um, yeah. But there's been so many millions of dollars put into chicken uh, research on what creates an optimal egg. You know exactly the proteins, the amino acids, everything, the whole, the whole mock-up is there. So I have to mimic it, but I have to mimic it with waste. And that's my, that's my adventure. This is my Michigas uh, as we move forward here. So on the subject of, well, plate scrapings, if you will, here's a question I've never asked. I don't think I've ever asked, and I think I know the answer, but let me ask you. Um, lately, with the restaurant suffering and the economic stresses, I've noticed more and more restaurants are not automatically serving bread and butter. And they are yeah. They uh, charge you for it. It's an extra charge. You, you want bread? Food. It's fifteen bucks. Yeah, but if they didn't charge you and they just put the bread basket on the table, which a lot of places still do, um, and you suppose nobody at the table touches that basket, or one person takes a roll, what happens to the rest of that? In most restaurants, yeah, trash, trash, trash. trash. I'm not saying it to denigrate most restaurants because if you go to, as you know, as well as I do, you go to restaurants in New York, space is uh, we're separating that kind of thing for compost and then getting somebody to pick up the compost to an unknown farm. It's just the headache, just mere physical space, no space to do it. So I, I we do it. Uh, we're, we're very methodical about what comes back from the kitchen. Uh, but, but the law says that if that bread basket went to the table, 
And it came back and it was untouched. No bread was eaten. Everyone was the gluten-free thing, right? Then no, it wasn't touched. It came back in the kitchen. You still cannot, obviously you can't reuse it. Uh, you also can't serve that to an animal. Uh, you have, you, but you can go to compost. So that can be made into healthy soil ultimately, or, or you can feed it to a chicken that lays eggs. That's what we're doing. That's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, well, um, this is, um, I, I want to change the world through uh, chickens fed waste feed. Wouldn't it be so nice to have an omelet in the morning that was a free omelet? That'd be so, I think I just, I would feel so, uh, that's how I feel about our pig. Well, when I eat ham from our pigs, it's a free pig. It's everything was going to the trash and the pig not only got fed with it, but created the most, that's what a pig is. I mean, Jesus, again, here I am. I didn't invent anything. I just repackage it. What are pigs, what were they put on earth for? They put on earth for to repackage, to, to take waste food and create meat. I mean, that's what they've been since the beginning of time. It's only the last hundred years that we've started feeding it tons of grain because our tax dollars go to support grain in the Midwest. So it's cheaper to do that. Ah, makes no sense. So a lot of this is returning to the wisdom of our- Yeah, except, our that, except that what you're doing sets an awfully good example, but at the same time is not- uh, I don't think, unless you have a system in mind, viable for serving millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people, even in this country, the people who want a burger every day or a slice of pizza, uh, to reconcile their needs economically, calorically, taste-wise with what you're doing is a huge leap. Will it ever happen? Well... I'll push back. I can't believe I'm pushing back on your wisdom, but I will. I think we have to change our diets. Yes, I think it can happen. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this work for the one percenters, for, for you and me and the people who can afford to come to a restaurant. The work is for everyone, but the diet has to change. Who said that a seven ounce piece of protein twice a day, seven days a week, centers your plate, a steak, a salmon, a chicken breast, and a smattering of vegetables and grains is the way we should be eating. Who, who said that? We did. Well, I never did. Ameri yeah, oh, you never did, but American food culture said that. And, and that's because we're a very rich country, not just rich this way, but rich uh, agriculturally. We came, we were a young country. We had ex inexhaustible supply of soil fertility that created a huge abundance of food that we exported all over the world. And that created this food culture where seven ounce pieces of protein are what's for lunch and dinner. That's or the carrying capacity of that on the world is crazy. So you're right. My or system of feeding chickens and my, my what's that? Or a half pound of pasta. Well, I, yeah, I mean, you know, nothing wrong with pasta, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of how the wheat is grown, but that's yet another, really it's the protein that's the problem. So when you see, when you say your system is for, you know, not for the hundreds of millions of people and the five, you know, the billions of people that are now going to be on our earth in 2050, uh, you know, I, I would push back and say, who said the diet needs to be that? Um, you know, all of this is feeding a diet that's totally unsustainable. And by the way, it's not that delicious. A six or seven ounce piece of protein twice a day, as you know, yeah, no, nah, who wants that? Increasingly, people don't want that. So I think we have to get back to some of these cuisines that celebrated proteins, but as smatterings, as as actually as 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 flavor enhancers for grains and vegetables, not the other way around. Yeah, but unfortunately, in parts of the world where that system has maintained for centuries, if you will, they are turning more and more to the American style diet. We are exporting our craziness to the rest of the world. You're right. Um, so we need to we need to really look at this um, because it's it's destroying our environment. It's destroying our health, um, the health of the planet, and our own personal health. You look at COVID and 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 what we succumb to during COVID versus other countries. It's all about diet. Um, so I think there's a real moment of reckoning right now. So that's why I'm digging into my chicken experiment. Well, the other thing to realize, I think, if you go to Europe for example, or even parts of Asia, uh, and you go shopping in a market to realize how cheap our food is, is a wake up for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you get smaller portions in other countries, because food is not as cheap as it is here, not as accessible as it is here. And, uh, you know, you can't complain as an American about the price of bacon. A lot of it is subsidized by the government to begin with. But subsidized by the government is subsidized by you. 
That's the problem. Yeah. You are the government. You are the taxes that are going to 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 make corn and soy so cheap, which is what feeds the pigs and feeds the chickens. So yeah, you eat a lot of meat, um, but not only is that not good for you and not that delicious, that kind of feed for the pigs is not delicious and it's not good for you. It's absolutely destroying our environment, and that this is what we need to stop, and we need the food culture to shift. So that's what we're after here. A larger message. Well, we have about five minutes before we open this to questions from the audience, but I'd like to change the subject a little bit, uh, or maybe a lot. Um, you, in recent years, have become kind of a mentor to up-and-coming chefs or to people who want to get into this field, which is really a uh, huge opportunity for a lot of people who don't have great education or might have uh, not great language skills or any of those things. And even starting at the bottom, it's a field in which one can rise to the top. Uh, and there are many examples of that, yourself not included, but never mind. But talk a little bit about how you are creating programs that do help up and coming chefs and, and what you want them to learn and how you're going about it. Right now, for, since COVID began, we turned the restaurant over to a residency program. We've invited chefs from around the world. Uh, most of them you have not heard of. Well, you have heard of them. Most people have not heard of them. Uh, they, uh, for the most part, lost their kitchens because of COVID. Uh, and we turned over this mecca of farm to table cooking uh, uh, experience to other chefs to reinterpret. You know, I've had 20 years behind the stove at Stone Barns to, uh, to interpret our landscape and to celebrate this connection with farmers, but I've done it through the Eurocentric viewpoint. So we've introduced West African cooking, we've introduced uh, Chilean cooking, we've introduced uh, uh, Chinese food. We just finished a, a resident uh, chef uh, with, with Chinese food reinterpreted through the lens of Hudson Valley uh, ingredients. It's fabulous. And to, to next week, we start with Adrian Cheatham, who used to be a sous chef at La Bernadette and is looking at um, a soul food uh, through the lens of the Hudson Valley and the immigrant experience. It's just brilliant stuff. And these are all chefs who uh, are as talented, more talented than I am, who have never uh, uh, gotten the, the, the spotlight. And so we're giving that spotlight and hoping that they will take the uh, lessons that uh, are learned from their experience with us and clo as close as they are to farming and farmers and um, uh, repurpose that wherever they go with their restaurants. So that's our program for the last two years. And how's it going? I mean, how's it, been, yeah. how's it been received by your dining public? Well, thanks to you initially writing about it, we have been sold out from that article forward for the last year and a half. Uh, and the the diners are, you know, ecstatic. I mean, it, it's just it's just funny. It's like, you know, you 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 realize um, how much people want to eat better and and understand different cultures and cuisines and, and expand their minds through food. Uh, partly for entertainment and pure enjoyment and hedonism and pleasure, and partly for uh, learning how to uh, inspire their kids to eat different foods. So it's been a great journey and I hope it continues. So we're, we're, we're ending the residency in the fall, but uh, I hope to bring it back. And then the change at Blue Hill in Manhattan. Oh, Florence, I heard you wanna write about that and I'm not ready, but uh, I just- It's on website, come on. Uh, you, no one goes to the website, Florence. You know who goes to a website these days? All social media. I haven't done anything. We we just take the restaurant in New York, which has been closed since COVID, and there are a couple of people who've worked with me for a long time who wanted to uh, do something. And I recognize that we have all these farmers with the harvest now that are harvesting incredible ingredients. And uh, we said, okay, we're going to do something very very simple, and we're going to do uh, one course. Everything on the table at the same time, uh, and um, uh, everyone's going to eat uh, together. Uh, four tops, six tops, eight tops. I'd say we're not doing two diners kind of thing. Uh, and you're in and out in an hour and a half, and it's 100 bucks. Boom. That's it. That's what we're trying. Well, now that you have written about it, I have to be there starting next week. So, uh, <laughs> No, I think, it's, I think it's a really interesting concept because, look, it's family meal in a restaurant. You know, what yeah. you feed staff. And... Basically, people love that. I remember yeah. when um, uh, at Chanterelle, uh, yeah. 
when David would open family meal to the public, he would sell out in two seconds because people wanted that more than his regular test tasting. That's right. Yeah, no, for sure. The question is, how do you pay for it? But I'm going to figure that out. Just like I'm going to figure out the waste fed chicken egg. Uh, I'm going to figure this out too. That's so interesting. Okay. Well, Joe, I think we're ready for some questions. If you have any, if not, we'll just keep talking. Sure, sure. We do have quite a few. Uh, the first one comes from Julie. Uh, the question is, what meals from your own childhood are most memorable or influential? Oof. You know, I, what comes to mind is my aunt, Toby, who, who was an amazing cook. Uh, and I, 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 had a, I had a, my mother died when I was very young. Uh, and so uh, my father uh, tried very hard to cook at home for me and my brother. Um, he was a terrible cook. I mean, just miserable. Um, and my aunt was a big influence because she was a gourmet cook. Uh, but my dad used to prepare these scrambled eggs for me in the morning, which just, I mean, you, you, had, well, you had a knife, right? And you were cutting into them. So that, those were the scrambled eggs, you know? Bless, I mean, bless his heart. He was trying so hard. And, and you know, those were eggs for me and I grew up eating them. And then one day when I had strep throat here at Blue Hill Farm, uh, I woke up in the morning, just the worst strep throat and, and, and fever. And my aunt Toby uh, whisked eggs over a double boiler and uh, made scrambled eggs that were, that were fluffy, sweet, light as a cloud. And I remember taking the bite and having them slide down my throat. And, I, and in that one instance, I thought, this is so powerful. And I didn't, I'm not going to say I thought, oh, I'm going to be a chef because I was, I was 12 years old, 11 years old at the time. But that moment of tasting what eggs, you know, could be was transformational. I have to say on before I give my aunt too much credit, without my dad screwing up the eggs, I would never have appreciated my aunt's eggs, right? So I actually owe that moment to my father as much as I do to my aunt, I think. <laughs> Next question, uh, Judy wants more details about the salmon that you prepared for Florence. Where did you get it? What type of salmon? What was the cut? It was uh, the apps. Well, I remember what, picking the piece for, for Florence because I had it tagged. It was, uh, it was closer to the belly. You want it on salmon, close to the belly is where the fat is. That's where they store the fat salmon, wild salmon in particular. On, on the farm raised, they've gotten it so that it's actually very nicely spread out. But on wild salmon, the fat is generally in the belly. So I had the, the sort of the, the center cut belly piece, if you were, if you will. Um, and I, I uh, did a, a, um, a, a technique that was all the rage in France, because I had just gotten back from, from two years cooking in France, and it was uh, salmon au unilateral, which is, which is you cook it only on one side, the, which is the skin side, and you, you a crackling skin, you never turn it over. And it uh, and and it and it's uh, high heat to crack the skin, and then you put it in the oven at low heat, and the salmon just barely cooks, barely cooks on top, but it cooks through just slowly. And then when you turn it over on the plate, the, the skin is crackling, but underneath is is actually almost raw. Uh, but then as it sits on the plate, and the warm plate keeps cooking it, by the time you get into it, as Florence did, it it really is perfectly cooked. So I nailed that one, and um, but as you can see, I haven't forgotten a detail of that. <laughs> Did you, did, you didn't do a, a sorrel sauce like Poirot. <laughs> like Toigro, no, you're, you're referencing the famous uh, dish that completed that was a sorrel sauce. And no, I didn't uh, because, you know, I wanted to do my own sauce and show you how creative I was. That was a balsamic sauce, as it were. Anyway, Oy, yeah. memories. The next question comes from Amy Kerwin, our chief creative officer at Guildhall. Uh, the question is about your chickens. Uh, do they eat all post-consumer waste and how do you prepare it so they can process and digest it? Great question. And the answer is uh, we're fermenting all the post-consumer waste. So we, we cre we're creating the sludge and then we're adding 2% uh, by weight salt, if you want to know. And uh, it's fermenting the vegetables and the grains and, the, and, and actually the meats, uh, which is essentially cooking them, transforming them, which makes the nutrition of the post-consumer waste more bioavailable to the chicken. The chickens love it. And that's what chickens want to be eating. 
uh, is food that's already pre-digested because for their digestive system, it's how they can uh, make all those minerals and vitamins available to them. So uh, that's what we're that's what we're doing. Uh, uh, pre-cooking it through fermentation. Interesting. Next question comes in from Rita, one of our volunteers. Uh, while you were talking about um, uh, the changing our diets, her question is, what is your vegan meal? My vegan meal or, or what would I cook for a vegan? I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. My pro, I, I, we cook for a lot of vegans in the restaurant. You know, I don't love the vegans who will eat chicken and fish. I don't love those vegans. And considering that I'm on a dairy farm, and I'm a dairy evangelist. I tend to, you know, um, uh, speak very highly of milk, especially when it when cows are raised in the right way. I think they're they can actually transform our part of the world. Um, this is what built the Hudson Valley was dairy, um, and and it, it, you know our climate is really geared towards dairy. So there's a lot of reasons to support that through drinking milk, but. If I were to go to meal for vegan in our restaurant, you know, we tend to have 35 courses. So it, it but, but generally speaking, it's, it's a, a, an equal amount of vegetables and grains because we, we serve a lot of grains in the restaurant and I love working with different grains. Now I'm not just talking about wheats, but, but all different grains that are super delicious and, and very healthy for you. You know, it's interesting if I can jump in here on the dairy issue, because about maybe three weeks ago, the Times did an analysis of all of the uh, non-dairy milks out there and their, what they took to raise the base ingredient and what their nutritional profile is. Um, and reading that article, I could only conclude that I'm doing the right thing. Name, my husband is a milk drinker. I drink a fair amount of milk in my coffee and I use it in cooking. And many years ago, a cardiologist recommended 1%. And we started drinking the 1%, and I never liked it. And about 10 years ago, I said, nuts to this. I am going to drink whole milk, and I am going to serve whole milk because it is less manipulated yeah. than all of these so-called low fat. And it isn't enough. There's not enough fat in there to ruin our, our cholesterol and all of that. We don't have a problem. Right but I really believe in whole milk. And I think that you don't get enough nutrient uh, when you drink these alternative milks, which is why there is such a market now for these so-called protein drinks and stuff like protein bars. We don't eat protein supplements because we get enough protein in the course of our regular diet, but I'm really passionate about the milk and I couldn't live without cheese. Bravo. Beautiful said. I, the only thing I would advocate for is grass-fed milk. If you're going to drink yes. milk, oh, I would advocate grass-fed. Only, or, only grass-fed organic. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's the right way to go. Can't, can't go wrong with it. I, I, I wish I had that on recording. Oh, we do. We have this in recording. I'm going to use that clip. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're vegan, you don't consume dairy because you don't consume animal products. And I think that's a huge problem. Okay, yeah. uh, Joe, anybody else? Sure. Uh, next question from Catherine. Uh, have you thought about using vermiculture to process the post-consumer food for the chickens? We have, yes. And we're exploring it as we speak. We, we're going down many routes for this. So I described one, but there's also the possibility of vermiculture for, for I mean, that's a type of composting. So how, what, and the chickens will feed off of it. That's actually a system that other people are doing. I just got off the phone with someone last week who's doing it in Vermont on a very large scale, uh, which is very exciting. So yes, yet another opportunity. Next question. Uh, could you speak about Alice Waters Place and the role in the development of thinking about local seasonal food? Well, Florence, you have more perspective on that than I do. What, what would you, what would you, how would you place her and Chez Panisse in the continuum? Well, let me put it this way. If Alice Waters lived in Detroit and had a restaurant in Detroit, it wouldn't, it couldn't have been Chez Panisse. The fact that she is in California and what is available for the table in California, even before farm to table became a thing, uh, she was very, very fortunate very fortunate to have the 
farms, the suppliers, the weather, forgetting what's going on now, but the, the seasonality in California uh, is not the same as say in Vermont and it's not as challenging. And at the same time though, I've got to say that she play has played a very significant role in, uh, as you talked about the farmer, developing a culture of chefs in the market. It's a market theory and, uh, and it maintains. And uh, you know, the other thing to look at is without chefs, the farmers would not be growing. There's a huge give and take. The farmers would not be growing a lot of the stuff they grow. I look at the farmers out here. Farmers are very set in their ways. Ask them to do something new, uh -uh. it takes a long time to convince them. And before you had farmers growing arugula out here, you had to have chefs preparing arugula for a salad and people wanting to have arugula in their fridge to make salad at home. And that's, and then so the farmers started growing it, maybe for the chefs or for their farm stands or for local retailers, but there's a very symbiotic relationship between, and it even maintains between the farm and your average supermarket shopper. I think that's right. I think that's right. She was the forerunner of, of putting a spotlight. Um, and, and, you know, it's become mainstream culture, food culture now, which is which absolutely. Is now. Yeah. And she has been uh, very, very influential as her career has evolved in teaching children about good food. And it, it's, it's a significant effort. Yeah, I agree. Next question. Uh, can you recommend the best slash easiest produce for home chefs to grow on their own? Yeah, herbs. I think herbs just transformational. Windowsill herbs. I mean, Florence, I'll have you should weigh in this too, but herbs transform the most uh, uh, work a day meal or simple meal, pasta, uh, you know, a simple salad, tomatoes this time of year. If you've got some clippings of dill, parsley, chives on your windowsill, pff, another level. Quickest thing, the easiest thing, and the most satisfying thing, I think. Florence, what do you, where are you at this? No, I agree. In fact, um, salads made entirely of herbs where herbs oh, are kind of oh. center of the plate. But right. I have one huge complaint and that or question, why is it that the farms here grow basil so big? You go to Italy and your yeah. basil leaves are the size of my thumbnail. Yeah. And they're not these huge woody stalks with these enormous leaves, which why is that? Do you yeah, know? Yeah, because the money you you get from the weight of basil, you know, when it's mature versus the small stuff is the difference between making it worthwhile and not. And we don't have a culture that supports it. I mean, a demand for it. Uh, but we will. That'll. Ch I think that'll change as people continue to cook with fresh food in the same way that people demand, you know, vine ripened tomatoes now versus ten years ago when they when they would never pay for that. Yeah, Here, and also, I mean, using stuff like the leaves. <laughs> Uh, celery. Yeah. Celery leaves are, I mean, it's like lovage. It's oh, the best. And phenomenal as an herb. Put it yeah. in soup. Yeah. Great, great one. Well, you know, and that, here you go. Here's the thing I do with my kids. Uh, they love uh, ants on a log, you know. So we peel back the celery. When we get to the core, uh, you know, the leaves, and you get the core and the leaves out of here, we stick that in a little uh, uh, bowl of water and it, and it grows beautiful uh, celery grains and you clip that. It's your own celery plant. That's the easiest thing to do. Do that today. Take the heart of celery, cut off the bottom. So it makes sure, cut off, not, not the whole core, but leave, leave it up so it stands up on a bowl and the water gets into the root system and you'll have beautiful um, oh, uh, celery cool for the summer. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's a tip for you. You didn't get that from Bobby Flay when he was on with you, uh, Florence. Huh? It's free yeah. recipes. Anyway. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, he'd put it on the grill. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else, Joe? 
I believe this might be our last question. Uh, it's for both of you. What is your favorite simple dish to cook? Lawrence, what I'd love to know this. What do you what do you cook in Sunday night dinners? Or any night dinner. I think my one of my favorite simple things to cook is a risotto. And this business that you've got to stand over it and babysit the stirring for 20 minutes or whatever is just nonsense. I mean, I've made a risotto three quarters of the way, set it aside and come back and finished it. And it's been perfectly fine. Uh, my one- so No stirring, no stirring. Well, some stirring, certainly in the beginning, yeah. you need to stir. To activate the starch, yeah. Yeah, and you got the rice grains have got to be evenly right. cooked. Right. And the other tip that I've picked up not that long ago, but that I think it might have been from, uh, I don't remember who it was, doesn't matter, uh, is to add a dollop of mascarpone at the end. Makes that, a big That would be a French chef. And yes, uh, that, is, that is what I do too. Yeah. It's a little bit. That's well, beautiful. I guess creme fraiche, but I think my mascarpone is better. Better, better. And when you've got a, if you've got a little saffron, that's all you need to flavor your risotto. I usually keep mushrooms on hand and I use those or dried mushrooms that I reconstitute. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't be easier. Yeah, that's great. Great. I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I don't, I haven't made risotto in a while, but, uh, you know, I really love a, I, I really love pasta, but I, you know, you're asking me at a time when I've got two kids who, who adore pasta and, and, you know, that's their go-to dish. So it has to be my go-to dish for simplicity. And we do that a couple of times a week, which is, which is great. Great. So I think we're all the money in terms of time, aren't we, Joe? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Florence, for spending your Sunday with me. Well, what a, what an honor to be able to talk to you. Well, uh, I really appreciate the time that you've taken and I appreciate what you do and just keep at it. It's fabulous. Thank you. I'm, I'm leaving you and I'm going to ask my chickens right now from the, the little, just a little bit more scraps every day. And then it's some, someday, sometime you're going to get on your desk uh, a gift from me. 100% uh, uh, waste-fed chicken egg, okay? Not chicken. so far away. Okay. Yeah, you know, speaking of eggs, what color are the yolks of these eggs? Because what a chicken eats, like what a fish eats, so affects- I'm glad color. you asked that, and I wish I had a picture, but Florence, if I flash the picture on the screen, you'd have to put sunglasses on. It's so orange, so bright uh, orange. It's like it's screaming beta carotene, health, nutrition, uh, it's the holy grail. That's the thing. It's like when a chicken gets to eat that kind of diet, uh, it's really foraging in this incredible diversity. It pays you with an egg that's, uh, that's, that you, you will never forget, never forget. Why do you get eggs in Israel that sometimes have yolks that are almost white? I don't know. It's funny you say that. I don't know about Israel. I haven't been to Israel, but I, I've been to certain other parts of the world, like Italy, where they feed certain feeds like flax and they make the egg yolks very yellow, almost orange uh, from the feed. It's very reactive to the to the feed. I mean, the, yeah, the yolk, I mean but it's a real sign. You get hard cooked eggs in, in Israel where the yolks are really almost white. And I don't know if that, is that, are they delicious? They were eggs, you know, on a salad or on a buffet you or something. You wouldn't be saying that about my eggs, they, Florence. They you would not be saying out. that about my eggs. You would have my egg. You would never say, yeah, an egg. You would say, oh my God, I didn't know an egg could taste like that. Yeah. And then you know what? We'd eat, be eating less eggs. Because you, you, you really, if you have this egg for dinner, you know, with, with a little salad and, 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 you know, a piece of bread, that's, that's a meal. You know, that's a meal. You don't need four eggs uh, that are tasteless. Uh, you need one really spectacular egg. Anyway. Okay. I want to prove this to you. I need Thanks to eat. again. Enjoy the rest of the day. And Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody at Guildhall, all the technical staff. You've done a great job. And thanks to the audience. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>